Hi, I'm Eric Knowles, and I'm the president of the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to the Member Connection. Before we get started, a word from one of our sponsors. This is garbage, and you probably think all of it just goes to waste. But in Miami-Dade, we convert most of what you throw away into energy. In our waste to energy facility, we can turn about 90% of your everyday garbage into reusable fuel. Levels look good. That creates clean electricity for our community. Enough energy to power 35,000 homes. Pretty illuminating, huh? In Miami Dade, nothing goes to waste. Hi, and welcome back to the Miami Dade Chamber of Commerce's Member Connection. And you know, I just learned something new just a little bit before we get started, but I'm not gonna let you know what that newness is just yet. But this morning, you know, I have the proud honor of having Mr. Ronald Tompkins here with us with Watson Rice Accounting Advisors. And you know, I'm sitting here reading, and I should know this because you've been around quite a while doing yeah. what you do. Yes, yeah, since 1971. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, that's quite a record. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, you last... know when, you, when you talk about businesses, and I'm going to get back to that, but BCA, BCA Watson Rice LLP is one of the nation's oldest culturally diverse public accounting firms. Their firm's nearly 50 years of experience in providing auditing, accounting, tax, and consulting services to non to non-for-profits, to organizations, employee benefit plans, and government clients. 50 years. Yeah, we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's amazing, because, you oh, know, yeah. we talk about business, and being that you are a CPA and you're, you are an accountant, and what they say, most businesses don't last the first year or first two years? First, first year. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so what gives you that longevity? Well, one of the things uh, we've prided ourselves on, Eric, is um, we try to give our clients a value for quality service for the value. And uh, we've uh, proud of the long-term relationships we've had with clients, both on a national level as well as in the individual offices in which we practice. Um, Tom Watson and Robert Rice, the two founding partners, uh, they uh, they prided themselves on just relationships, and that has carried over oh, for over 50 years. Wow. And at the end of the day, we know it's all about relationships. Exactly. And, and you said in the communities that you serve, and where are, where are those communities? Uh, we are headquartered in New York City, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Maryland, uh, in, in Florida, we're in Aventura, as well as Miramar. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's 50 years. That's a lot of growth as well. It sure is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I know accounting's had a lot of work to do. Obviously, it's just tax season is, is wrapping up, at least for individuals, for businesses on a different uh, time schedule. But for the last couple of years, we've all been challenged. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges uh, that we've ever seen uh, in terms of businesses being shut down uh, because of COVID. Exactly. And I know that you, as an accountant, as CPA, were very much entrenched in that process. What was it like for you? Well, one of the things that became interesting, uh, Eric, we had to uh, pivot uh, almost on a short-term basis. Uh, we... Uh, as I indicated, we prided ourselves on relationships, contact with our clients, and we had to go from that to remote working. Right. And so did our clients. And so what we, the challenge for us, as well as our clients, was trying to maintain the same level of service, but in a remote and safe environment. Right. Um, and with a lot of the government uh, regulations that had come out, uh, we had to continue to deal with the evolution of those. Um, and one of the things uh, at the conferences uh, that we as uh, CPAs uh, typically uh, have conducted over this two-year period of time, uh, one of the things that's been constantly emphasized is when, on the one hand, it was very positive that the government was able to immediately come out with the 
type of aid that they came out with for businesses right. as well as for individuals. But knowing government, federal government, the way we do, um, the backlash of that is going to be is going to be some heavy audit requirements behind that. Okay. And so one of the things we are closely working with all of our clients to alert them to is that you got to make sure your records are definitely in order to survive audits that may be coming behind us. Yeah. Okay. So the, the point that you're making, a lot of folks were able to access dollars uh, from PPP or EIDL, but now, as, as, <laughs> what it, as this, the saying goes, the chickens come to roost. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so the fact that you were um, awarded however uh, dollar amount that you were awarded, mm -hmm. the, 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 the important thing is that you kept records. Exactly. Of how you spent that money. Exactly. Because PPP was really there to pay your employees to keep them on. Exactly. And so if you didn't do that, there may be some challenges that you're going to see coming forth. Exactly. Exactly. And I know a lot of um, businesses had challenges because we go back to relationships. Mm -hmm. And a lot of small businesses had, and I'm not going to call any particular bank names, but a lot of small businesses had a bank accounts at a certain bank, but they didn't have the relationship mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the banks. Mm -hmm. And they were not able to access PPP through those banks. And they may have had quite a bit of money in those banks, mm -hmm. but again, they didn't have those relationships. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, one of, one of the things about the uh, loans as they were... Uh as they rolled out, and one of the things the Small Business Administration tried to build into the process was your access to the funds was not necessarily through the bank you may normally do banking with. So you were able to tap into other banks that you may not have a relationship with to uh, access those funds, but it, the, getting it through your bank that's familiar with you and you familiar with them made it a lot easier process, but it was not the only process uh, how you could access the funds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I know that, uh, to your point, uh, CDFIs uh, were lo loaning money. I know one that I, I will call is Lendistry. Yes, and, yes. Uh, it really helped a lot of the black businesses mm -hmm. uh, to access PPP and EIDL. And Lendistry just recently announced that they're joining forces one one united bank yes uh, our good friend here terry williams here mm -hmm. in south florida they have offices the main offices in boston they're located in la and here mm -hmm. in, in miami but they just announced that they are doing business loans through Lendistry because One United wasn't doing business loans. They were doing home loans and other type loans, but they weren't doing business loans. Mm -hmm. So now they're getting ready to do uh, loans up to, I believe, $5 million if I read properly. Mm -hmm. So how, is it, how important is that for a business to be able to have access to a loan? It's almost a lifeline. Uh, one of the things, uh, even for... Uh, a firm our size, uh, our business is on a pretty much runs on a cycle. Doing the way loans play a significant part is when our cash flow is not as great as it usually is, and during the business season, we need funds to kind of tide us over to right. it for that season to kick back in. And if it was not for the banking relationships we have, uh, we would not be able to retain employees and continue to the high level of service that we've come to know. But um, one of the things, uh, every opportunity I get to talk to uh, businesses that are seasoned businesses as well as uh, folk that are contemplating going into business, it's one of the first relationships you need to make sure you tap into is a banking relationship. Right. And the other thing about loans, you know, the I would say the best thing is to have it, access to it, and not need it. Versus exactly. needing it and not having access. In other yeah. words, you didn't do your homework. As I say, a lot of times is, is having the back of your house in order. Exactly, exactly. And so you want to talk about that a little bit? One of the things I'll never forget, uh, Eric, is uh, when we first started the Miami or, uh, practice, uh, myself along with Bernard Kuhn and William Washington, 
uh, we were both uh, very seasoned CPAs, and we had uh, and being as knowledgeable as we were, one of the first things we decided to do was make sure we had a banking relationship in order from day one. Uh, so one of the first things we did, even before launching the firm, we made sure we had a line of credit established with what was in uh, in place at that time, Southeast Bank. I don't know. Right, right, of course, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we um, we were able to get a nice line of credit with uh, Southeast Bank and uh, had done. And probably being CPAs in both seasons, we overly probably forecasted <laughs> how much we needed. But right. uh, but, it was, but I always value that relationship and that uh, loan that we have from Salvage Bank is what really carried us over and got us going. Mm -hmm. What would you say is one of the biggest challenges with small business when it comes to accounting and, and maintaining the records? The, the biggest challenge is uh, the the... With small businesses, I think is uh, especially when they're just starting out and they're trying to make a trade-off between uh, cost and benefit. And so, as things start to get tight uh, financially, one of the services they feel that is much is not as needed as much needed as others, uh, their products, their employees, and that type of thing, is uh, the need for accounting services. Really. Oh yeah, and so I would uh, think that would be one of the ones that you maintain. It, well, th that's the one probably you should <laughs> want to maintain. But as things start to get tight, it's one of the ones that, uh, and a lot of times uh, businesses look at CPA services, accounting services, as, as, as a as a commodity. They start looking for the cheapest thing. I, I, you know, who, who can I pay the cheapest right, and right. still get something, uh, as opposed to what value. Do I get for my money? Right. And most CPAs that are worth their money will uh, kind of convince the the client that here's the value of my services. This is we're we're partners in this together, and we if as long as we got each other's back, we're going to make it through this. And, right. Uh, and and if nothing else, the pandemic has really uh, forged that relationship and brought to light the importance of that relationship. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Because you definitely had to have, um, as I say, your house in order to be able to access these monies. And as you said, now the auditing after the fact. Exactly. It's been a couple of years, and now the government's going to start looking at your records to make sure you've done exactly what you said you were going to do with those monies. Exactly. You know, when we, f we first started, I said I learned something new. And I'm really proud to sit here with you because, uh, you know, I talk about the, the chamber, the fact that it's been around since 1974. And, you know, you, you think about the chamber was named the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And Miami County, it was Dade County. And it wasn't until about maybe 15 years ago or so that they changed the name to Miami Dade. Exactly. County. Exactly. So you guys, and here I'm saying you guys. <laughs> so this thing that I just learned is that you were part of the beginning of the chamber. Yes, I was the first secretary of the board. Uh, wow. Uh, when Dave Fincher became the first president. <laughs> right. Yeah. That that is amazing. So mm -hmm. tell tell me a little bit. What was it like back then, starting the chamber? Well, it was some, some exciting time. Uh, we had some. Uh, uh, businesses that were really uh, kind of uh, the pillars of the community. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, you know, he had the uh, uh, security firm. Right. Uh, George H. Green had a very well-known uh, insurance practice going, and uh, Hank Mack uh, uh, also was a budding uh, uh, accountant in the in the, uh, in the community at the time. And one of the things we we did is uh, we really uh, I think at the core was just the, and although these firms were kind of seasoned in their own right, uh, one of the things Dave and the board wanted to make sure we did was bring other businesses along. Right. And uh, so uh, just that uh, whole, that uh, one of the organizations I belong to is the National Association of Black Accountants, and our logo is one hand reaching down and pulling another one up. Right. And I think in a... Uh, Special kind of way that was what signal that that was kind of the same motto as the Miami Dade Chamber when it started. Right. We, we wanted to help each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and again, 
I think back, this is 1974, um, I think about 7th Avenue and all the businesses that were along 7th Avenue, all the businesses that were on 62nd Street, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was our, the heart of our com business community. Exactly. Well, to, tell people what was that like? That, that was a very vibrant uh, uh, times, uh, Eric. Uh, even probably until last month, uh, one of the things I'll never forget is uh, even though our individual practice was pretty much in different locales around uh, Miami-Dade County, I found myself almost on a weekly basis then as well as still, like I said, until a week ago. I don't know if you remember uh, Mop City. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, Johnny, of course. You know, John the Cadillac Johnny seats. Remember when the Cadillac seats first came in? Exactly. Johnny Cheely is still my bro. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I found myself in... Uh, Probably one of the original businesses that we're back in seventy, back in seventy four. That's still on Seventh Avenue. Oh, oh yes. And then on Fridays, I found myself there on Sixty Second Street. Uh, uh, Davis Brothers. Uh, oh, Davis. Oh man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dave. Oh gosh, man. Let me tell yeah, you. Oh yeah. So the it, twins. Exactly. Oh man, you you talking about some good eating? Oh yeah. So th things were exciting back then, and uh, uh, probably the. Uh, Probably, I, I think uh, what was probably the, the things where things dramatically changed was after 1980 when we had right. the riots. And, right. uh, but uh, until then, things were really um, exciting in that particular area of the county. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I know you, you mentioned the riots, and obviously the riots uh, w was very impactful on our community in terms of, uh, to your point, of businesses being challenged. What would you say again, having a, a mop city still around, obviously Miami Times, mm -hmm. they've been around probably one of the oldest businesses in, in our community. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, again, as far as longevity, what does a person or a business need to really put in place to look to the future? I think the important uh, thing now as we look to the future, uh, Eric, is uh, businesses as we've historically known them, for them to evolve and be a really competitor in the future, got to learn to think differently. I think uh, especially for businesses, uh, minority businesses, we got to learn to, uh, as we were talking about earlier, I think uh, what's going to increase our chances of survival is consolidation. We got to learn to trust each other, do That's more business with, do yeah. more business with each other. Right. And also bring talent together in one place. I think tr the days when you have one sole you know, one sole proprietor trying to do it all on their own. Right. I think those days are, are, are probably long gone. I think for the future um, when you're competing for products, you're competing for talent in your workplace, you got to learn to bring all those resources closer together in consolidation. Well, you got a little bit of time left. If you wanted to leave something with, with our audience, um, how can they get in touch with you? And what would be the last parting words you would like to share? Well, we, we're located, as I indicated, uh, we're uh, located locally in Aventura as well as in Miramar. And uh, I can be reached at, um, and one of the interesting things about relationships, as we've indicated earlier in our business, we typically uh, give our clients not only a business phone number, but we give them a cell phone number. Right. You could probably see on the card that I gave you. Yeah, I actually the, gave it to you. <laughs> yeah, one of the first numbers on there is the cell phone number right. because we, we, we believe in 24-7 service. No, that's and uh, so one of the things I just want to leave with the audience is uh, if you're interested in services of a CPA nature of any kind, we full service, we do it all. And with the big uh, discussion in the marketplace now being cybersecurity, we actually... That's the service also we provide. And so um, we, I can be reached at 305-962-2721. That's my cell phone number. No, oh, that's great. All right. Well, this has been the Member Connection. We are having our Business Leaders Lunch and Symposium on May 20th. 
check in with the chamber and find out more information. 305-751-8648 or www.m-dcc.org. Hi, and welcome back to the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce Member Connection. As an, I always tell you, I'm excited, and I got a reason to be excited today. We're going to talk about money. I'm going to introduce you to my guest today, Miss Merlandi Landy Simeon. And she's going to tell you who she's with. I know who she's with. You're going to learn today about who she is and what she brings to the table. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. You know, I could have told the folks all about who you are and what you do and the organization that you represent, but I think it's, it's amazing <clears throat> that you're here and the organization that you represent has been around a long time doing some amazing work in our community, in particular the black community. So let the folks know who you are, first of all, and then we'll talk about that organization. Alrighty. Again, my name is Merlandi Simeon, but I do go by Landy. Um, I'm the new regional director here for this company that you speak <laughs> of, um, providing uh, you know, financial literacy, financial resources to primarily the black community. So again, our goal is to assure that we're able to help our folk and um, ensuring that they have the knowledge to hold the capacity to, you know, to maintain financing. Right, and I know this organization has been around a long time. Um, they were formed um, through the state and some banks came together to help support that. So let, let the folks know who, who, who you're here representing. So I'm here representing the Black Business Investment Fund, also known as BBIF. The Black Business Investment Fund. Correct. That's, that's pretty strong. It is very, very strong. And as you mentioned, Mr. Knowles, it's, um, we've been here over 30 years. 30 years? Yes, over 30, three decades. Wow. Three decades. And, I'm, and, you know, and I am sure a lot of folks do not know that you even exist. We, they don't. And that's why we're here today to tell our, our members, tell our community about BBIF. So uh, what is BBIF? So BBIF is a CDFI. And basically- Say, wait a minute now, you're going from BBIF to CDFI. So what is a CDFI? So a CDFI is a, a, a it's like a, it's a bank, right? Okay. But they provide financing, but it's a community development financial investment firm. So basically, that's what the acronym stands for. Right. So what it does is um, the government basically, like you just mentioned, got all these um, um, companies together and said, hey, we need resources in our community. And we need a company or people that's going to be able to relate to the people in that community. So one of our, our CFO, which is Miss Inez Long, who's been over the program close to about the 30 years. Wow. Right. So she's she started this um, particular um, company over in Orlando. Okay. So predominantly they've been, you know, dominating it there. Then moving forward, they, we, we opened a location up in Jacksonville. And then we've seen the presence and the need for the people here in South Florida. Um, so we, we extended the branch down here right. to, to, extend, to extend these resources to you know, our clients down here. Now, what these CDFIs, these are government type entities that the government says, hey, we're going to trust you or entrust with you to provide the resources and the finances to people in different communities. So now there's different types of CDFIs. Mm -hmm. There's CDFIs that may be able to only allocate their services to, you know, black and brown communities. We have to Latino communities, to the women, to the LGBTQ, like, so it's very different CDFIs, Okay. right? Now, I've worked for a major, major financial institution in my previous role for 10 years. And being able, I apologize, not being able to help the people that I'm the servicing the areas that I'm covering was very, in a sense, it, it, it hurt in a little it was bit. Challenging. It was very, very challenging. Right. And coming across, and you know, you're having individuals where you're looking at them, knowing that there's not much you can do for them in that capacity. Right. So a company like a BBIF, uh, Mr. Knowles' example, 
you, you know, you have a dream, you want to start up a business and you're like, hey, but I don't have the resources. If you can show that you believe in your dream first, right, of, mm -hmm. which I mentioned to all entrepreneurs, if you can definitely show, hey, I've invested maybe whatever amount of money it is into my business, but I, I don't have enough to push it forward. You bring us your projections, you bring us your business plan, we look at it and we say, hey, let's see what type of capital that we can provide you. We have about seven different loan programs, Okay. right? We are partnered with the SBA. So if you do go to the SBA website, we are an affiliated partner with them. So again, um, with BBIF, helping individuals in our community is the number one resource, um, sorry, is the number one tactic that we have. And also we wanna make sure that they're the financial literacy is there. So that's what sets us apart from different financial institutions with our technical assistance program. Okay. Uh, so we don't only just provide you the loan. So we give you the money, but you have to get the education behind it and it's mandatory that you get it. Right. So now you mentioned if a person had an idea and they've thought it through and they've accumulated some funds to help get that started. So can this be a startup? or does the business have to have a track record in order to come to you and, and possibly get a, a loan? Right, great question. So it, it kind of, it depends, right? So I have clients that call me and they say, oh my God, I had an amazing dream mm -hmm. and I feel like this dream is gonna take off and I need $500,000. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it doesn't work okay. that way. So when we mean startup, it's saying, hey, I did my due diligence. Okay. I did my research. I did my market research. I did my competitor research. And I've, example, let's say I, I want to throw an ice cream shop out there. There's, I want, I have, I make the best, the best ice cream. Okay, great. That, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So what have you put into this? Here are my projections. Let's say where you're working now, right? My, my job now or my career now is what's helping funding it, but it's not going to be suffice. So that's something we'll take into consideration as, as an example, as a startup, right? right? We want to show that you've put, you have some skin in the game too, right. right? So now we're not telling you like other financial institutions saying, hey, startup, we want two years of tax returns or a year of tax okay. returns. Okay. We need to show that you have some type of skin in the game. So that's okay. basically, I, I hope, hopefully that answers your question. No, it, it does. You know, um, what I hear you saying is, it, is you also put in place that a, a, a company, because you are a company coming to you, right. or individual, but you're forming a company, you have a company, but you have to go through your technical assistance to ensure that you're managing those dollars right. Absolutely. So the one thing that I know in our community and um, probably many communities, um, whether it's uh, the black community, the brown community, when the pandemic hit, a lot of us were left out. Hmm. And a lot of us were left out because, as I say, um, they didn't have the back of their house together. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that a little bit. What did you see out there um, as you know, a person managing a BBIF and, and companies um, you know, going through the pandemic, what were the challenges that you saw? Just as you um, mentioned, Eric, it's a lot of the companies didn't have their financial documentation in order, mm -hmm. which hence again, why it's so important to have the technical assistance, right? Now, during the pandemic, a lot of these major financial institutions, you can get your banker on the phone to save your lives, right? right? Now, these small mom and pop you know, institutions are like, this is their life. This right. is their livelihood. This is, this, the pandemic hit them, I, I, spill, I feel specifically in a different way, right? So the way BBIF came in and said, you can actually call your individual office or your loan officer directly, right? And with that TA program, with that TA team is saying, hey, Mr. Mr. Knowles, example, it seems as if you're missing this, this, and this. Here we have, actually we have accountants, we have CPAs that we are affiliated with that's willing to help you get this okay. in order in order to push this for you in time to save your business, right? I wanna very, I wanna stress the fact that here at BBIF, our default rate is less than 3%. Okay. In order to, to, to get people to pay 97% of the time. Right, that's it, not easy. It's, it's really not. And the reason why is because the education behind it is educating our, our, the, our people, letting them know, 
it's not as hard as you guys make it seem. Right. It's just getting the education around it. So during that time, that's how we were able to help them. And then a lot of, and, and I say it all the time, um, you have to build relationships. Yes. Um, a lot of businesses were not able to access funds because they did not have a relationship with those banks that you talk about. Right. They may have had deposits in the bank, but did not build a business relationship. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So relationships are important in every aspect of your life, especially your money. Right. The person managing your money, you, that needs to be your best friend. <laughs> if you ask me, that needs to be your best friend. You need to have that person on speed dial. Right. right? Just like your spouse. I, I feel like outside of, you know, your immediate family, that person should be next. That's the person managing your money. Right. Once your money is not there, your livelihood is gone. Right. So relationships are extremely important. Right. And setting the right expectations and managing expectations is our, you know, a colleague of mine that also works for BBIF, Miss Kalina up um, in North Florida, who she always tells me that managing the individual's expectations. And what that does is it allows you, you know, hey, Mr. Knowles, this is what we need. This is what we need. This is how we but educating you right now, that relationship becomes different, whereas you're saying, hey, you know what, Mr. Knowles, I need, I need you to donate, you know, or, or make a deposit of half a million dollars in this account to save my quarter this year. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's basically how it goes. It's a numbers right. game, whereas, you know, hey, how are you? How's your family? Right. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. You know, I know you have your, your kids, your grandkids, however, how are they? Right. You know, knowing them on the first name basis. And that's the difference that sets us apart here at right. BBIF. Okay. So when we first started talking, you talked, about you have basically seven different products. Right. You want to talk and tell us um, what some of those are? Absolutely. So our one of our, um, a few are very popular items. So we have the micro loan, right? Okay. So the micro loan is typically for our startups, you know, businesses that are in a startup phase. And let me be very specific in what startup time frame is. A startup can be, go anywhere from zero months to two years okay. that's the startup phase so for individuals that might not know they might think they're in business for two years they're you know they're adequate to get the financing typically you don't start making money till after the two-year mark if you want to be honest right okay. so we have the micro loan to kind of help with that so if you need working capital you need payroll expenses you may need you know equipment purchasing like and that that goes up to a hundred thousand dollars okay right so this is more smaller these are clients that kind of need maybe twenty thousand fifty thousand that amount so we have the micro loan um, we have the SOAR loan right so the SOAR loan is for clients that have been impacted um, by COVID and might need, you know, the resources to kind of, you know, get back on their feet. And, you know, we have our general business loan. This is our type of, this are bigger loans that we can kind of service clients that, you know, process, that need over up to $3 million. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So Wait, excuse me. Hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Folks, did you hear that? I, I think the number was up to $3 million. Right. Talk about that a little right. bit. Right. So a lot of um, individuals, when they, they seek um, businesses like ours or CDFIs, they typically assume that, you know, we can only help them on a smaller capacity. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, we're able to help right now currently up to three million and working to work that number up for clients, you know, that are in a higher threshold. Now, you have to understand these, there are certain clients that might need it's their, their, their business is it requires unique circumstances, whereas other banks um, or financial institutions, they just kind of look at, you know, black and white, you made X, Y, Z, and your company's this. We have a unique way or a, a approach on the way that we underwrite our loans, right? We take everything into consideration. You, you might have businesses or collateral that we may use that, you know, that, that might offset to show that you can support the loan, whereas um, other businesses or other financial institutions, my apologies, um, just strictly focus on the revenue. So this is where, you know, we're able to kind of push that limit. And usually the, the, those high dollar, the high ticket dollar um, loans are people that need owner occupied space, like real estate space, trying to buy a commercial building. And okay. um, we literally just closed um, on a loan for 1.2 million last week. Okay. Right. For a very um, prominent um, organization down here in South Florida. I'm very excited to share. So we are, we do have the capacity to go up to 3 million. Wow. So. That's a lot of money, <laughs> you know, these days um, for a, a business to be able to access $3 million, uh, that goes a long way. What type of businesses do you not support or serve? Another great question. 
um, of course, we have to protect um, the brand as well because at the end of the day, BBIF is still, you know, very being very political here, it's still a business. Mm -hmm. So we do have to protect the brand. So, you know, anything dealing with, you know, narcotics, you know, nudity, things, you know, things of like gambling, just the typical, right. the typical things that you would, you would like, uh, you know, the yeah. Mary, you know, I know the, the, the marijuana business is doing pretty good, but we're not supporting that right now. <laughs> you're not. No, unfortunately not. Yeah, not you see not them, right you now. see them everywhere. Yeah, I know. Right? They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're getting there. Yeah. And I guess that's probably because they're still not recognized federally, et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, and how long have you been in banking? I've been in banking for over a decade, so over 10 years. Um, again, I was a VP at another um, financial institution and then recently joined the BBIF family. So yeah, a clo a close over 10 years. Okay, and so what are your goals here? You're in South Florida now. As I said, you started in Orlando, you got based in, in Jacksonville. So what do you, what are your goals for South Florida? So my goal for South Florida, and I, I want to be very specific, I was born and raised here in Miami-Dade, okay. right? So being born and raised here in, in, in particular um, communities, I, 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 me personally, my family personally has been impacted by not being recognized and not being or having the resources to bring their business to the next level, again, because they just didn't know. Right. right. My goal is to educate or inform as many people down here in South Florida about what BBIF does. Right. Because we unfortunately we just you know, we see these bigger brands and think that's all we have. And these are the only folks that can help us. And that's not the case. So my goal is to assure that all entrepreneurs down here in South Florida know that there's different options. You don't just have to go down, you know, the, you know, this lane, you, there's, there's multiple lanes that you can kind of take to get you down right. the same route. So, you know, we are very reputable business. We've been in here, like, I, like, you, like we stated earlier, over three decades. Right. 30 years in business is not a small amount of time. No. And helping over, you know, thousands of other businesses that we've been able to help them build their dreams. So my goal here in South Florida is to assure the people here that we can help them, we will help them, and we will continue to help them. Right. And I know uh, there are CDFIs, small CDFIs here in Miami, and the one thing we talk about is graduating from the CDFI and then doing business with the larger banks. Right. Can you talk about that just a little bit yes. before we wrap up? Correct. So um, we're currently, um, we, we have connection with bigger banks. Like the, you name them, we have, we've, we have affiliation with them. Right. And they do help us both locally and on the national level. Right. Why? Because they, they do recognize that CDFIs have major impact in these particular communities. And they're, they're just, they're out of reach. Let's, I, I want to be very frank right. about it. They're just out of reach. And they need individuals that look like the other individuals to go into these communities to help with their resources. So like you, like you just stated, yes, we are working to go to that next level, but in the meantime, we are affiliated with a lot of these bigger brands to say, hey, listen guys, you need to help these people right. down here and let us help you guys do that. So if someone wants to get in touch with you? So if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can definitely first and foremost reach me on my email, which is msimeon, which is M as in Mary, S-I-M-E-O-N, at bbif.com, and my direct phone number, which I don't usually do, but I'm going to do that because I, I really trust the people here. So uh, my phone number directly is 305-570-2681. But most importantly, if you can go to our website, which is bbif.com, which is B as in boy, B as in boy, I, F, dot com, and they have all our resources there. And if you want to know more about the chamber, go to www.m-dcc.org or call the chamber at 305-751-8648. This has been great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So. And you know, every time you see me and every time I come on here, I tell you how excited I am. But... Today is very special because I get to work with these two people, these two individuals each and every day doing what we do. You know, hey guys. Hello, how you doing? Good morning. <laughs> Good, Good morning. morning, how you doing? Good morning. You know, it's great to see you both, Gina and, and Matthew. And both of them have a very important role at the chamber. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna let the, um, as they say, age before beauty. Uh, so, 
Matthew, you've been with the chamber longer than Gina. Gina actually is, is a new member of the chamber, and you've been around uh, as the manager of membership and manager of technical assistance. Mm -hmm. And Gina just came on board as a te technical assistance manager with the Small Business Development Center. But uh, we'll get started with you. Uh, how you doing? I'm loving life. Yeah. I'm glad to be working with the chamber and here on this uh, program. Right, right. So you have a very important role. Both of you have very important roles because mm -hmm. you are probably the first point of contact that a lot of our members engage in. And, and in, in a lot of instances, they're not even members of the chamber. You're just mm -hmm. engaging with the business community at large. So tell us a little bit about uh, the membership engagement and, and what it means to the chamber, Matthew. So my role at the chamber is that I am the front facing uh, person for all of our engagement with um, our members and small businesses that want to come in into the chamber. And what we do is we make sure that small business owners in South Florida have a place they can go to to network with other business owners and learn about different resources and opportunities that they have um, locally in Miami-Dade County, South Florida, and also some national opportunities. So my biggest role is to make sure that when small business owners are looking for assistance and help, um, I'm there to be that guide for them um, and introduce them to all the resources and opportunities that we have at Miami-Dade uh, Chamber and also through a lot of our partners. Right, right, right. So a lot of resources and, and that's what we are. We are a resource organization. Mm -hmm. A lot of it we do do, but we have a lot of partners in that process as well. You want to talk about that? Yes, um, our partners is what brings the value of the chamber uh, because one of the things that we're big on doing is making sure that small business owners have access to capital um, and government contracts and corporate contracts. So we have strategic partners with Miami-Dade County, Miami-Dade Public Schools, um, a partner for self-employment, the Florida Minority uh, Supplier Diversity, um, the Miami-Dade um, Economic Advocacy Trust. So many of these institutions are the gateways to contracts, to grants, to loans, and we're the ones that help business owners to make the connections um, be with these agencies and get them prepared to step correct um, right. to these um, partners and institutions. And um, one of the beauty about being here at the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce and being a member of the Chamber of Commerce is because we're like at the epicenter of all these different partners and agencies from governments to nonprofit organizations and corporations. Um, and we serve as that gateway and we continuously are building those partnerships and developing them so that our members and also those who come to us for assistance um, can understand what's the best way to approach and connect with these partners. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that again um, in terms of connecting. But I'm going to switch over to Gina. Gina, you, you're brand new with us. Yes, I'm very glad to be here and to be able to continue um, assisting the, s the small businesses in, in Miami-Dade. Um, the um, new program manager for the Miami-Dade um, Navigator program. Um, it has it's a program that started um, based on the Ameri America's Re um, Recovery Act of 2021. And it's a program that is led by the SBDC at FIU, together with five more um, local um, businesses that um, provide support, you know, as far as technical assistance to um, s small businesses in Miami-Dade, um, to specifically cater towards uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. Um, LBT community businesses as well as veteran businesses. So, right. So the SBDC Small Business Development Center they've been around a long time um, at FIU, but recently they, um, as you said, uh, through through um, going through the pandemic and, and a number of things that has taken place, this um, navigator program was was created. And as you said, the chamber is a number one of what we, one of the spokes in the Navigator program. And why is it important that we have this Navigator pro program? 
I think, um, you know, the beauty of the program is that um, all the different uh, local partners have been working, um, you know, and helping businesses, but there's now, a, it's more institutionalized where um, each one of the, the partners refer to each other, you know, it, it becomes more like a, a bigger team to help the businesses in Miami-Dade succeed. So um, from, you know, one helping with the, their business plan to getting them access to financing, to marketing, to government contracting. So, um, you know, the spokes and the hub, which is um, the SBDC at FIU, we work together and uh, so. Right. Now, Matthew, going back to this whole thing about members, I mean, chambers, it's mm -hmm. all about the membership. Otherwise, yes. there is no chamber. Mm -hmm. And true. as you said, being able to connect the membership to the opportunities. But there's, a, a, I would say, a misnomer. A lot of folks don't know exactly what chambers do. Mm -hmm. So can you explain that a little more? Um, a lot of people may join a chamber and they're there for a year. You know, we talk about this all the time mm -hmm. and they say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. And mm -hmm. you know, the one thing that I say, if you don't put something into something, you're not going to get anything out exactly. of it. So you want to talk about that a little bit? It, well, you hit it right on the head. At the end of the day, a chamber is an organization just like every other organization. And you have to join it and be a part of it if you want to um, really take advantage of it. And with the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, um, being a member of the chamber, what that actually means is that you have the opportunity to be connected to resources. We're the, opportunity, we're the people that connect the dots um, between uh, contracts and opportunities to grant programs, loan programs, and we connect it with other business owners. So we do a host of events uh, that provide networking opportunities where you can network with other business owners and people that are in our community, along with corporate partners and government agencies. Um, and these events range from Zoom events online where we talk on our small business meetup um, every Tuesday at four o'clock to our four major annual events. So going to those events gives you an opportunity to number one sponsor, to get your name out there in front of a large amount of business owners and also to network. And then also you're part of our listserv. So we get newsletters that we send the, when we, we're the first ones to know about many opportunities because when these corporations, when um, government agencies, when they're first starting to launch their programs, they come to us because we're the black and minority chamber and they want our businesses and organizations. So what we do is we're the ones that send that out so that you know what's happening. And then lastly is the engagement. And this right. is through our committees. Right. So we create spaces in which business leaders within their um, industries, whether that be advocacy, nonprofit, um, marketing, um, South Dade, they can come together and talk about issues uh, within their particular, particular industry and then figure out what they can do together, leveraging the power of the chamber and our networking members. And, you, you know, you talk about committees. Talk about, let's go a little deep. We kind of, <laughs> kind of skipped around that a little bit because I know, you know, there are, as I say, a plethora of chambers in every city, mm -hmm. um, every town, every uh, area. Uh, we have the Greater Miami Chamber. We have the Coral Gables Chamber. And we're a member of the coalitions of chambers, which um, uh, Key Biscayne Chamber, Chamber South. There's a Haitian American Chamber. Um, the North Miami, um, North Miami Beach Chamber, Aventura. So for chambers to be around and that many chambers, it's got to be something chambers are doing something right. Exactly. So, but how do they do that right? And I know a lot of that is done through committees. Talk about the committees a little bit more. So uh, we run our committees. We give the members an opportunity to really uh, put forth what they believe is the most pressing issue for their particular industry. So it's those in the room that make decisions on the direction of how that committee is going to go. So we have 12 committees, and I'm gonna give you an example of um, some of them and what they do. Um, first is our advocacy committee. Um, the advocacy committee, they wanted to open up government procurement for minorities um, in the bidding process and also know about these opportunities. So what they did, they leveraged our um, board appointments we have as a chamber along with their own personal board appointments 
and they um, now sit on these different boards from Miami-Dade County, Miami-Dade Public Schools, City of Miami, City of Miami Beach, and they use their monthly committee meetings to debrief from all those different um, committees, which makes them one of the most knowledgeable when it comes to government procurement in Miami-Dade County um, because they're constantly hearing from all these people, and then they use best practices from one area to take to and propose to another. Right. Uh, which is different from our construction committee. Our construction committee, they said they want to raise the capacity of construction contractors in South Florida. So they made a, 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 a big commitment to raise their revenues by $1 million. So how would they do that? It's like, you know what? We're going to target billion dollar construction opportunities at major institutions like Jackson Health, University of Mi Miami, FIU, Brightline, and then have direct connections with the decision makers of those places to let them know that there are um, contractors and, and figure out what we need to do to get our contractors ready to take advantage of those opportunities. Right. Which, okay. Go ahead. No, finish. Which is different from our education committee. Our education committee, they wanted to create spaces for more educational professionals to network because they found that while their teachers, their principals, their education consultants, their nonprofit organizations, many of them operate in their own silos. So they wanted to create spaces in which networking opportunities where these professionals can come together to make connections, to learn best practices from the teachers, from the principals, to the nonprofit leaders and make those connections. So they're doing networking opportunities and they just had one this past Monday um, at Red Rooster. Right, right, right. Well, Gene, I'm gonna jump back over to you talking about SBDC and, and technical assistance. We know that a lot of businesses were left behind when it came to um, when the pandemic hit and we're talking about uh, PPP and EIDL. And the one thing that I talk about is the fact that again, a lot of our businesses don't have the back of their house together. So talk about that and what the SBDC is doing to change that dynamic. Sure. Um, again, it's one providing um, the technical assistance to get ready, um, one for, for access to financing, for example, where um, not necessarily if they're uh, credit is okay and um, and or they don't have their um, you know back in order in order um, to get them ready for stuff like you know getting access to financing um, you know I, I, I mentioned business plan uh, crucial um, you know uh, you know their their financing their um, their books need to be in order um, and you know, at that the time during the pandemic is you know when it was needed, but now is even more. You have to always be ready for when you know it. You know, the access to finance is needed, so you need to be prepared for that. And um, that's where you know programs like the Navigator program and all the partners involved are are, are key. You know. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. And to, 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 to piggyback on that, uh, what, one of the things that Gina and I do is that we're the people that small business owners can go to and be very frank about their situation. Right. <laughs> and yeah. we can tell them how to get their back in right, yeah. how right. to prepare for these opportunities and take advantage of these contracts and get their back in. So we're that source because a lot of times there are workshops, there are programs that people go through and they're just like have all this information. Right, inundated and, with all yeah. kind of information coming from one side to the other side. Now now, what do you do with that information? Exactly, yeah. and what we do, we sit down one-on-one -on -one with those business owners, identify what's their highest priorities, and then help them step-by-step -step to implement the information that they learn from these different places, mm -hmm. and then make connections to those uh, different institutions like branches, ascendus, and these other partners that we have um, in the Navigator program. Right, because as you said, branches and, and, and these other programs, some of them actually are CDFIs, Correct. and they, they provide um, loans, 
Some of them actually provide grants. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that I say, it's, it's better to be prepared and not need money versus not uh, being prepared and needing money. Exactly. So when I say that, explain that to some folks. <laughs> <laughs> so the process for accessing capital, if you're not going in a conventional market, can take time. Right. Almost between three to 90 days, sometimes six months. Right. And so usually when you need money, you need it now. Right. <laughs> like, right. I need to purchase this marketing right. campaign. Right. Right. Exactly. I got to do this video. I need a, a printing and all this stuff. Yeah. I need to hire this employee. So you want to be prepared to make sure that all your documents, whether it be your profit and loss statements, um, your licenses and certifications, your business plan, um, and also your pitch to these places, how you talk to them, you want to be prepared so that when you need that fund, you can just yep. click, 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 send this information, and then go through the process from there. And that dramatically reduces the time it takes mm -hmm. for you to get that check in your bank account right 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 so you don't you don't want <laughs> again you don't want to have a need and not have been prepared Perfect. you want to be able mm -hmm. to have built the relationships mm -hmm. with your banker built the relationship Correct. with your marketing team built these relationships because you, ne you never know when an emergency is going to come about and so when very that emergency true. hits all you have to do is push the button very true mm -hmm. right very true. so um What's new? What's what? What's next with the chamber? Oh man! So what we do have coming up this weekend is our little black dress and pearls. Well, actually, that'll be passed by the time we. Be <laughs> oh, that's passed. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all, all good. Right. Um, so we have two other events moving forward, our uh, annual golf tournament and then our gala. Okay. Um, those are the two things that we'll be having moving forward. Uh, we're looking to secure uh, more funding for our technical assistance program mm -hmm. so we could put on a series of workshops. Um, and coming up, we have a few workshops that are focused on are you ready for government contracting right. and how to market to your ideal client. Okay. Yeah. So, so if someone wants to get in touch with you, Matthew? Um, I would encourage them to either call our office or go to our website, www.m-dcc.org. Um, and you can go to our services page and technical assistance to schedule one-on-one -on -one, uh, with either of us. Um, mm -hmm. And also you can sign up to our uh, listserv. But the best way I think I would encourage everyone is to join our small business meetups every Tuesday at four o'clock. You don't have to be there. You can listen in. It's on Zoom and you're meeting with 20 to 40 uh, small business owners and we talk about a variety of topics. Okay. Um, and you get so much support um, from that. You'll know all the events that we have coming up and also you'll connect with other business owners and know what the chamber has. All right, and Gina, same thing. Um, you know, to get in contact me directly is gortella at m-dcc.org. And, or you can call the office as well. You know. Okay. If you want to know more about the chamber, like Matthew said, www.m-dcc.org or call the chamber at 305-751-8648. This has been the Miami-Dade Chamber Member Connection.